So I just recently got started in this uh, exciting field uh, of, uh, you know, aquariums and uh, pumps and so forth. Um, uh, but that said, I, my, my uh, background is in uh, flow measurement. So I'm a pro professor from Purdue University. Uh, I've been there for a while. Um, my expertise is in flow measurement, and so I got started working with MaxSpec, uh, looking at some of their pumps. Um, and I see at the bottom here, I'm, I'm not at all an aquarium guy, so, but it's really interesting stuff. Uh, and I think a lot of my expertise uh, translates into this area. Uh, in particular, what we're trying to do is to bring um, some more high-tech technologies uh, into the um, uh, analysis, the, the design process, the design of, uh, of aquarium pumps. Um, and the technology in particular that we're using is called particle image velocimetry, which is, uh, you know, quite a mouthful, um, but it breaks down really easily. Um, so I'll talk about, uh, you know, I might say particle image velocimetry a couple times during this talk. Um, it's abbreviated PIV, which is a lot more, a lot less threatening. Um, but even, even the particle image velocimetry is, it contains within it the description of what we're doing. Um, so we use the image of particles moving in our flow to measure the velocity, right? If you take this apart, velocimetry is measuring velocity. So really, pretty straightforward stuff. Um, so here's uh, this little animation that a friend of mine uh, at NASA worked up, really uh, gives us a nice uh, introduction to the technique. Um, and, and so the way it works is, you'll see this is um, an animated GIF and it, and it loops. Um, so the way it works is we start with, well maybe I'll start here. So we start with some model. And in the case, you know, if you're a NASA guy, the model is a wing or a spacecraft or something. So there's a wing. And, um, and, you know, this is the kind of stuff that they're really interested in in NASA. What does the flow over a wing look like? What does the flow over a spacecraft look like? Um, and so the way that they answer those questions is by uh, sticking the thing in a wind tunnel and then measuring the flow over it. And the way that you measure the flow is, okay, so imagine this, this wing is in a wind tunnel. There's a flow from left to right. Um, they stick in a, a particle generator um, which is generating this, you see this cloud of particles. So this particle generator generates this cloud of particles. They're carried by the, the flow, and they flow over the wing. So when the particles are small enough, they just passively follow the flow and don't do, um, you know, they, they tell you how the flow is moving. All right, so you see this cloud of particles, and it, it passes over the wing. And while that cloud of particles is near the, the wing, then they make the measurement. And the way the measurement goes is uh, with a high-speed laser. So if you can't read that, that says laser. And you see two pulses of light. Uh, so the laser light comes out of the laser and runs through a couple of lenses and then illuminates the, the wing and the particles that are near the wing. And the reason that you use a laser is because the flow is very fast. And actually, the same thing's true in uh, an aquarium flow. So, I mean, maybe it's not, uh, it's not Mach 3 or anything in an aquarium, but it's, it's quite fast. Um, so you see the, um, as the particles come by, you see two flashes of green light. The laser is, you know, lasers are really uh, complicated devices, but essentially it's just a flash bulb. It's like a flash bulb on a camera. So it goes blink, blink takes two pictures, or illuminates the flow twice. Down here is a camera. The camera sees those two flashes of the laser and takes a picture of where the particles are um, as they're passing over the wing. And so the camera, you see the output of the camera is right here. And you see those two pictures, right? There's the wing again. And you see the cloud of particles, which are now stationary, because I've taken a picture of them. Uh, and then we run these pictures, we'd stick these pictures into a, a computer. And the computer uh, analyzes how the particles have moved. And that tells us what the velocity uh, over the wing, what the flow over the wing looks like. So you see the little arrows there, the arrows indicate where it's fast or slow, and they tell you the direction of the flow and so on. 
So that's really the, the basics of particle image velocimetry, and that's the technology that I applied to aquarium pumps. Um, so to tell you just a, a bit more about this, um, here's another picture. This is, this, so that last one was one that uh, a friend of mine took. This is one that I took in my lab. Um, you know, we were looking at a wing previously. This is now uh, a very small micro nozzle. So something, you could think about this like an inkjet. So now we're applying PIV in microscopic uh, size scales. Um, and you see, the, the reason I like this one is you can really see how this thing works. Okay, so it, and it and it's literally as simple as connecting the dots. Um, when you watch these particles, the, the, the white dots that you see are particles, and you see a before shot and an after shot. And you could tell, you know, here's where the particles are moving fast, here's where they're moving slow. If I gave each of you a pencil, you could tell me, well, you could sketch out what the velocity field looks like, no problem. Um, to make it, the way that we do this with the computer, rather than connecting the dots, is we chop the image up into small sub-images that we call interrogation windows, and we analyze what happens in those interrogation windows. And I promise this is the only equation in the presentation. And, and, and actually, you don't have to look at it even. Um, so what we do is we have those small windows from the previous slide, and we compare you know, what does the window look like in the first frame to what does the window look like in the second frame. So this would be the window, let's say, at time zero. This is the window at time, I don't know, uh, 0.1 second later. And you see, okay, there's four particles there. And you can see basically there's four particles there. They've moved a little bit down and to the right. All right, so I compare how these particles have moved with this equation. Now that equation, that's just the equation for a cross correlation. And you know, I think to make this more accessible, I can just say, you know, if I ask you when, if something correlates with something else, you know, what does that mean? Does it kind of look like? Does, this, does one thing kind of look like the other? That's what the correlation tells you. So when you compute this formula, it tells you what has changed between these two pictures. And what has changed is that the particles have moved. So it's just a mathematical way of telling you how far the particles have moved, rather than passing out pencils to the whole crowd and connecting the dots. Right? This, makes it, this makes it more quantitative. Um, but we, uh, we compute that formula, and we get a peak. And, um, and the peak tells us, hey, the particles have moved. So this, this peak would be located, let's say, in this case, uh, the particles have moved downward and to the right a couple of pixels, so this peak would be located a couple of pixels from 0, 0. And that gives us this one velocity vector. And we do that thousands of times, and we get this, uh, what the velocity field looks like in, in the case of this pump. All right, and by the way, you know, I guess this is a little bit of an unusual audience for me, and right? I'm used to talking to um, uh, academics, and so uh, feel free to ask any questions as we go along. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so this, these guys, <coughs> correlating these guys would represent one of these arrows in here. Um, but this this region that you're looking at there does is the bottom half of this picture, and, and I'm not sure. Uh, these two come from one of these, these two have created one of these arrows, and I'm not sure which one, um, and, and it's not that important which one it created, but it is, you know, one of these arrows comes from correlating these two pictures. Uh, question? Ah, uh, yes. That's a very intuitive question. Um, so the way that you, so the, uh, the question is, what happens? You know, so I happen to have chosen. I've, I happen to have chosen a, a couple of easy to explain spots. Right in this picture, there's four particles. In this picture, there's the same four particles. You can kind of recognize them. One smaller. You know, like the middle one is smaller. These guys are bigger. So you can kind of recognize those are the same four particles. And that's that's the easy one to explain. Now, it, it could easily happen you see these particles that they move downward and to the right, it could easily happen that if this pattern started out, let's say, down a little bit, 
then this guy moves downward and I lose that bottom particle. The bottom particle goes out of the picture. And then I have three here and four there. Well, the answer to that question is, is statistics. Um, if, I, if I'm likely to have a, um, a significant population in common between the two pictures, let's say, you know, if, if I have three particles, if I lose the bottom particle here, if that goes out the bottom, then I still have three particles in common. These three particles correlate with those three particles, and I've got this, this one left over. And so that, that forms a little bit of noise. That gives you measurement noise, the fact that there's an extra particle in here. It makes your correlation not as good. But as long as you lose fewer particles than you keep, then it, the, the measurement technique works. All right, so that, and if you think about it, then that, that relates to how many particles do you have in your picture, how big are these, each of these windows, so there's a lot of constraints. I don't know, does that, does that clarify? So, yeah, yeah, so, and there's a huge parameter space of, you know, how far can the particles move, how big do the windows have to be, how many particles are in the flow, so, uh, and actually that gets on to our next slide. Uh, which is, um, I'm scratching the surface on this. I want to give you the, just the basics, like, you know, the basic understanding of how does PIV work so that I can then explain how we used it with the pumps. Um, and to, to tell you that there are a whole bunch of issues that I'm not talking about, and, and even this, right, some of you are already tired with this, the, the, the degree of technical uh, explanation that we're going into. There's, uh, there's books written on this, so there's my name and the third, the third author here. There's whole books written on this, um, and so the question that uh, our audience member just asked about, you know, what happens if you lose a particle, that's, you know, that's like five pages in this book, so uh, we're not going to go into that kind of detail, um, but uh, if you're interested, uh, you, you know, you can go and check this out from your local library. Although I don't think anybody goes to libraries anymore, uh, and and very few people buy books anymore. So, uh, any case, uh, this just shows you that this is a uh, let's say a well accepted field of study, and there's a lot of uh, details here. All right. So the next thing I wanted to do was maybe show you before we talk about aquarium pumps in general to give you an idea of the sort of the range uh, of applications that you can use uh, PIV for, uh, just to give you an idea of what it can do. So this is my PhD work. This is a long time ago. This was about 20 years ago at Northwestern University. Um, and what you see here is you know, a, a complicated little device for filtering uh, whole blood. And this is, we're, we're, we're making PIV measurements inside of this device. And the thing I want to show you is it's like a movie. So if I can take a picture of something, I can make a movie out of it, and I can, this movie tells us what the velocity, what the flow inside the device looks like. Um, so uh, that's one thing. Here's another. This is a, an application that you have daily experience with. Anybody recognize that? Yes, it's a toilet bowl. So uh, believe it or not, um, Manufacturing toilets is a high-tech uh, job, and this is a Kohler company hired me a while back uh, to optimize the flow through the toilet. You know, they, they want to flush as much as possible with as little water as possible, so uh, I took a lot of uh, grief for this from the secretaries in my department, but uh, anyhow. Um, Lots of different applications. Now, there's one that you may have seen, that, that those of you here may have seen and may have paid attention to because, uh, because of your interest in aquariums, and that is uh, Deepwater Horizon. So this thing here, um, you may recognize from, uh, from TV uh, in, in 2010. Uh, Deepwater Horizon, you remember, was a ship that sank uh, while they were uh, exploring for oil in the Gulf of Mexico. And, uh, and ended up spewing millions of gallons of, of oil in the Gulf. And one of the questions in Deepwater Horizon was how much oil is spilling? Because it, it, it's basically like imagine uh, you left your garden hose lying in, in your yard 
And, uh, and then you mowed the lawn and you mowed the end off the garden hose, right? You mowed the, the valve off the end of the garden hose. So the garden hose is spraying water all over, but you don't know how much is spilling, right? You don't know how much water is running out. And frankly, in the garden hose case, you don't care. But in the Deepwater Horizon case, they needed to know how much oil was spilling for a couple of reasons. First, you know, how do you, how do you clean it up? So if you're going to collect the oil and put it on ships, you need to know how many ships do you need. Um, and then there's uh, the, the legal aspects of it, which just finished this year. Uh, the legal aspects of it are, you know, when you make a mess, you have to clean it up and, uh, and pay for it. And so the, the size of the mess determines how big of the fine, how big the fine was. And so um, this was summer of 2010. We had about 100 scientists working on this problem. Came up with a really good answer, what we thought was the, uh, the most likely um, size of the spill using uh, PIV as one of the tools that we relied on. And in the end, all of these scientists worked on this, and it was a judge who decided how big the spill was. I mean, the judge considered uh, what the scientists said, but in the end, it was a judge you know, with a gavel and no technical training who decided how big the oil spill was. Anyhow, this stuff was all over. So you know, this was, uh, here's me and Anderson Cooper, and this is just a, a small list of where you might have seen this. Um, I'm a professor, so I teach classes in this stuff, and uh, here I am uh, teaching uh, how PIV works to, uh, these were freshmen at, at Purdue University. Uh, that girl there is my younger daughter. No, maybe my older daughter. My older daughter is sitting over there. That might be, is that you, Katie? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's Katie right there. Uh, so she didn't know I was going to show her up on, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but what I wanted to show you is there's, there's all kinds of different applications. So these are literally, you can't tell it from here, these are rubber ducks that are floating on the surface of this swirling pool that we have at, at Purdue. And I run this through my computer code, and you can see the red arrows there. The red arrows show you how fast the flow is in this pool. Now that's really just a demonstration, uh, but it gives you an idea of the kind of stuff that you can do with PIV. So, uh, maybe at this point I could ask any, any last questions on PIV. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, flow physics of jet pumps. All right, so anybody want to leave? Uh, <laughs> so, the, so, and I don't want to make it, um, th there's a little bit that I need to say about how jet pumps work, how pumps work in, in aquariums. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about uh, two kinds of pumps. The first is uh, w what I call a single point or a round pump or a propeller pump. Um, essentially, it's just a spinning, a spinning propeller. Uh, and the second is uh, a gyre pump or a cross flow pump or uh, uh, I would call it a sheet. Right? It's sort of a, a long, thin sheet pump that, that pumps a, a sheet of fluid. Um, and these are the two geometries that are very common in, um, uh, in the aquarium pump world. Uh, and both are classified, if I, if I you know, put on my uh, professor mechanical engineering hat and classify these in, in terms of the, the way that they work, they're both classified as what are called jet pumps. And the jet pump is you somehow, you get the fluid moving, and you shoot it into a, a tank, which is initially stationary, and the jet of fluid that's moving pulls the fluid in the tank and, and, and moves the fluid in the tank. So that's why we call these jet pumps. Um, so uh, a little bit about this. So here's a, this is a, a sketch out of a paper from, I think, 1965. So it's, it's a, uh, it, here's the reference. It was printed, reprinted in 2000, but I think this was originally a 1965 figure. So this gives you an idea that jet pumps have been around for a long time, I mean, even a lot longer than 1965. Um, so, and both types of uh, pumps, the round pump, the, the propeller pump, and the cross flow or sheet type pump uh, can both be described by what you see in this picture. All right, so let me explain this picture to you a little bit. So you see this line on the bottom there and this line on the top. That's the uh, exit of the pump. Um, and that could either be, if it's a round pump, it's sort of a cross-section, like a slice through the pump. 
Uh, and if it was a sheet pump, again, it's a slice through it, but it's, um, um, yeah, so it, it, you would imagine that if this was a sheet or cross flow type pump, that it could go back into the page or out, come out from the page. And there's flow. Uh, so the pump is providing flow from left to right. So there's, there's some kind of flow coming out of this. I would call this an orifice or, or just a nozzle. It's not exactly the same geometry as a jet pump or a cross flow pump, but you can imagine, OK, there's flow coming out of this thing. And what happens? OK, well, the flow shoots out of the pump and into the tank. And the tank is initially stationary. All right, so the, the fluid, as it comes, the, the water, as it comes shooting out of the pump, is going, you know, this is going fast here. And out here is the stationary uh, tank fluid. All right, so the, the water that's shooting out of the pump is going to try to pull the tank fluid along with it. The tank fluid, which is stationary, is going to try to slow down the water that's shooting out of the pump. All right, so there's sort of a, a tug of war. And in the end, they kind of agree uh, that this, this jet slows down a bit and it moves the fluid in the tank. There's sort of, I don't know, an, an accommodation or a negotiation. And so the jet slows down, so you see Initially, it was, was this tall. And then as it slows down, it gets broader and broader and, um, uh, if, and pulls more fluid with it. All right. So OK. Um, this is a, from that same paper in 1965. Uh, here's, now we're looking, we're sort of zoomed out. And we're going to look at the effect on the tank. What happens to the fluid in the tank? All right, so there's my jet pump. And shooting out of the end of it is the, is the liquid, uh, is the water. And what you see, these arrows that you see here, this is the tank fluid. This is the tank fluid getting pulled in by that fast-moving um, jet of fluid. And now what this tells us, this, this is an important uh, uh, figure because it tells us something that, it tells us that we need to describe, we need to measure how pumps, be, how pumps perform differently than in the old days. Um, so, for instance, if I measured, if I drew this line here, this red line that you see, and then I measured how much flow crosses that line, I'm going to calculate a certain number. And how big a number depends on, you know, how big the pump is. But whatever, let's say I measure 1,000 gallons per hour there. Now, if, if I move farther out, draw that red line, measure the flow on that red line with my PIV machine, I'm going to get, let's say, 1,200 gallons per hour. And if I move even further out and measure the flow along that line, maybe I get 1,400 gallons per hour. All right, so the pump the, is now, there's no one single number that tells us how fast uh, a, a, a jet pump works, right? because that number changes where you measure it in the tank. So like if you have a pump in a, in a sump on your, uh, on, um, in, your, uh, in your tank, uh, that pump is always going to deliver whatever it is, let's say 1,000 gallons per hour. That pump always delivers 1,000 gallons an hour. This pump, it, it depends on where you measure. So we need, to, we need a better system uh, of describing how these pumps behave. Just saying so many gallons per hour is an incomplete answer. Um, and I don't have the final answer yet. We're still working on this. But, uh, but I guess the thing to point out is you can't just use a single point number to say how fast these pumps are. Um, so <clears throat> jet physics, I don't want to scare anybody off with this. Um, but I wanted to explain a little bit about the difference between uh, a round or a propeller pump and the cross flow or sheet type pump. Um, so you know, I use the same figure, the same figure to describe both geometries. Uh, the propeller as well as the, uh, the cross flow uh, or the sheet type pump. I use the same figure because they look a lot alike, but the way they behave is different. And the way they behave is described by these, uh, these equations here. Um, so if you're, not, uh, you know, if you're not a math person, this isn't going to mean a whole lot. But the propeller pump decays like x to the minus 1, which means 1 over x. It behaves like x to the minus 1. The cross flow decays like x to the minus a half. All right, if that crosses your eyes, uh, let, me, let me make it more uh, 
accessible. Um, so the red line here represents the round pump or the propeller type pump. And the white line represents the cross flow or gyre or sheet type pump. Now, the, what we see uh, initially, the way these behave, and, and actually don't, so what I'm plotting on the, ho the horizontal here is distance from the pump, distance from the pump outlet, and on the vertical is the uh, center line speed. That would be the, the maximum speed that the pump delivers. And if you look at these axes, you don't see any units on them. All right, don't worry about units. So right now I'm not talking about any pump in particular, I'm just talking about how do these pumps behave in general. The type of behavior that you would expect, you know, like let's say if this was, um, uh, if this was uh, any particular pump, if I ran it at half speed, I would get the same kind of behavior, but it would be shorter, something like that. So we're not gonna worry about particular units right now, just think about the behavior. So the red line is the round or the propeller type pumps, Propeller type pumps, they're very concentrated, right? It's a very small place from which all the flow comes. And that represents, when the flow comes from a very small place, it's highly concentrated and it has to move fast. All right, so a propeller pump starts out very fast and then it decays or the speed of the pump drops off like one over X as it goes through your tank. So the speed drops off very quickly and um, you see, the, the, so it drops off very quickly. The uh, cross flow or sheet type pump, because it decays like uh, one, x to the minus a half, it's, it's also, um, it's not as concentrated. So instead of the flow coming out of a small uh, propeller, it comes out of a, a larger, I would say, a larger region. All right, that means that the flow can be slower at the exit of the cross flow type pump and then we, we see that it decays like x to the minus one half, all right? So if I plot that up in Excel, decaying at x to the minus a half means that it decays more slowly than the, uh, the jet type pump. So we can look at this, we can look at this region. This region here, this is a little deceptive because the, the, the two lines look pretty close together. But if we zoom in on it, we can see, you know, once we get away from the pump, uh, the, the, it's maybe a, a factor of two or three uh, times. So that, let's say the, the, jet, the, the cross flow type pump is two or three times stronger than the, uh, the round type, propeller type pump. All right, so there's two conclusions to take away from this. First of all, if you're using a, a propeller type pump and you have this, um, you have anything too close to the propeller type pump, it's, it's very highly concentrated at the outlet of the, of the pump. And so you're going to, you're going to have this high flow, which, which you know, might not be good for whatever you're trying to grow. So the cross flow type pump has a slower flow right at the exit of the pump, but that slower flow persists longer, right? and persists longer at a stronger level um, than the propeller type pump. So that's the, that's the conclusion to take away from the math here. Um, and that stronger, um, slower decay uh, leads to um, a nice uh, global turnover in your tank. Um, now let me tell you a little bit about the uh, PAV measurements that we did in this, uh, uh, in this, um, with these pumps. Um, so the white line here represents a side view of my tank. I used a 200 gallon tank, which was a six foot by two foot by two foot uh, tank. Um, so that's the white line right there. This is the laser that you saw in the second slide that I presented. And the laser is projecting this green light uh, in my tank. It looks really cool, by the way. It's, uh, you wouldn't want to have any fish in there because I assume they'd be blind after they swam through the laser. Um, but uh, um, but it, it looks pretty neat. Um, so, uh, and we took a couple of measurements. So this is the, the pump. This is a cross flow type pump, and you're looking at it end on, so it's, it, it just looks like a circle. Um, and the first thing that we did was we, we imaged, we looked at a window that included part of the pump um, to measure the flow right out of the pump. And then we looked at the, uh, the flow a little bit farther away. All right, so those were the two places that we've been able to look at so far. 
Um, ideally, <clears throat> and this is the ongoing work, what we'd like to do is to, to take a step back. Right? These windows are kind of small. I'd like to take a step back and make that window big so that I can see the whole tank. Right? But we haven't got there yet. Um, so, uh, so I'll show you the results from these two windows. Um, and I should say, just for those of you who might want to try this at home, there's a few subtleties. And uh, one of them is when you're taking a picture of anything, you don't know how big it is, right? When you, um, you take a picture with your camera, and you don't care, right? When you're taking a picture of your relatives or something or the Grand Canyon, you don't care how big things are. But in my field, I want to know how big things are, and I want to know how fast they're going. And in order to do that, I need to do I need to convert from this, this picture that doesn't really have any size scale in it to, um, uh, to I, I need to know how big things are. And so a lot of times we do the easiest thing, which is we stick a scale in there and take a picture of that. And you see the scale has, this is, uh, has got centimeters in it. So then I measure how many centimeters, uh, let's say, here I've got 10, so I could go, let's say, 5 to 10, so I measure 5 centimeters, and that's, I look on the picture, and I measure, okay, that's 400 pixels, so now I've got a measure, I've got a correspondence between how many pixels the particles seem to move and how far that is in reality. And then if I know how many pictures per second I have, I can convert that to how fast are the particles going, All right? So basically, you'd call that photogrammetry, but, uh, you know, I just wanted to show you a little bit about how the practicalities of this thing work. Um, so there's our pump, uh, and this is uh, a max spec uh, gyre pump, uh, it's XF150, and you can see the pump right there. This is where the spinning, uh, um, the spinning paddle wheel is inside of here, and uh, it's, it's magnetically held onto the tank wall, so the tank wall is there, and there's my wire. And what you see, you see these white dots? So those are the little white dots that I showed you early on in the example. These are the particles. I've added, uh, these happen to be 30 micron uh, glass beads that I threw in there. Those would also be bad for fish, I'm assuming. I mean, we didn't have any fish in there, but uh, uh, you wouldn't want to do these measurements while you had fish in the tank. Um, so, the, so the next thing I'm going to show you is when we let the camera run, we'll see those particles move, and then I run those pictures through my PIV uh, computer code, and I get what the velocity field looks like. So now I can flip back and forth. So you see that, remember what I was talking about, that jet of fluid, the jet of water that's coming out of the end of the pump, you see that jet uh, right there. So, <clears throat> That's the jet, that's, you know, so this is showing you the initial strength of the, uh, the flow. Um, and uh, I don't have the, uh, I'm not presenting right now the numbers on how fast this thing is, but you see this is, a, this is that jet, that uniform jet. And uh, if we move to that second window, the window that's farther away from the pump, what's happened is, see how, there, there, I guess there's not a whole lot to notice here, especially from your seats, you can't see this really well, but, um, you can see all the arrows are about the same size. So that means that the, the flow is, is gone from this, this jet has expanded. Remember that, that sketch I showed you where the jet was expanding? Well, the jet has now expanded. In, in the second window, it's expanded and it's very uniform. So the flow is, uh, I don't know, this, this, would be, this kind of flow would be friendly to, uh, uh, to whatever you happen to um, be in the path of that flow. Uh, it's not very, not very highly concentrated. Um, so I'll conclude here and then take questions. Um, so just to reiterate the points uh, that I made based on the PIV measurements as well as the mathematical theory, the, uh, um, these cross-flow type pumps, they penetrate farther into the tank than propeller pumps. Uh, they are more distributed and I would call them gentle, I mean, to be, uh, to be, um, I don't know, touchy-feely. They're more gentle at the pump location than a propeller pump. Also, the speed decays more slowly uh, than a propeller pump. And what that is, the, the take-home message from that is, if you have, so I had, this was a 200-gallon tank. It was six feet long. Um, if you put your hand in on the end opposite the pump, six feet away, you can feel the momentum of the pump. Uh, and so the, 
the, the speed decays very slowly, and uh, it, it, that leads to a strong global circulation uh, within the tank. So for ongoing work, uh, we're going to do a, I would call it a zoomed out view. So I showed you these two close up views of the pump. We're going to do a zoomed out or global view. So maybe next year uh, we'll talk about that. All right, so I'll conclude there, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes. Yeah, so how do we take into account the, the geometries of the pumps? Well, so <clears throat> in, in uh, yeah, so what, what I do, um, I guess maybe the answer to that one is I try to do a cross section. So I try to cut through both types of pumps. So that said, I haven't measured the, the propeller pump. I haven't done that yet. Um, but in order to compare the two, what you would want to do is is to measure the same sort of plane, the same the plane that shows the same sort of behavior. So with the round pump, you'd want to cut right right through the middle of the pump, and look at what the flow looks like coming out of the the pump there, and do the same thing with these the sheet type pump. Now, in terms of and you mentioned energy, so yeah. 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 That's true, that's true. So yeah, if, if um, right, and so things like, um, uh, you know, speed decays more slowly than with a propeller pump. Well, yeah, if you take, uh, if you're not comparing um, the same wattage of pump, uh, you, could, you could make, you know, you, you could sort of tailor the results uh, to get the, the answer that you want, right? You could put a really high, if, a uh, high-speed propeller pump and, uh, you know, and, and, and find that the flow carries a long way into the tank. Um, but the, I guess the thing I would say about that is the pump geometry, so the propeller pump versus the cross-flow pump, um, this is, uh, this is the, the physics. So this says, you know, the, the speed decays more slowly. That's, that's actually, that's the, the physics of the geometry. So a round pump, this, the flow is always going to decay more slowly than a, a sheet type pump. Um, yeah. Sorry? Yes, yeah, sorry. I got mixed up. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not sure that that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think maybe what, what, maybe another way to plot this or another way to display the results would be what, and what, what you really care about is circulation in the tank. So circulation in the tank per amount of energy input, like how much circulation in the tank do you get for 100 watts, right? I think that would be the answer to your question. That would be, I think that would be a better way to compare. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, that's a good point. I think we, uh, as we're thinking about how to describe these pumps, how to characterize the pumps, the thing that you would care about, as as um, you know, as the hobbyist or enthusiast is, you know, how much am I going to pay when I plug this thing into the wall? How much am I going to pay versus how much circulation do I get in the tank? So that, that's a good suggestion. Um, maybe we can think about some performance spec like that. So, yeah, question. The first PIV. PIV. Yeah. Ah. Oh yeah. Okay. Right here. Yeah. It could be. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Well, yeah. There's so there's um, th there's two two things uh, that I can tell you about that. The first is. Um, 
as these jets uh, get farther from the, the pump, they can flutter. Um, that said, I didn't notice that sort of behavior. So the other type of behavior that you can see is it's turbulent flow, which means the picture in one, one instant is going to be different from the picture at the next instant. So in the next, you know, the next picture that I took uh, might have been all straight, or it might have been pointing down, or so turbulent flow. You know, when you're when you're on the airplane or something coming here, uh, right? Turbulence uh, is is a random flow, uh, and so the the thing that you I guess the thing that we'd like to have is not the this would be a, I would call it an instantaneous measurement. Um, we'd want to have we want to take a hundred pictures and average those, and that would give us the instantaneous measurement. But then the thing that you might care about with regards to to coral or other animals in here is there's two things. The instantaneous tells you over long times how much, um, how much water is flowing past my coral. Um, but then you would also want to know about the fluctuations. You know, if, it, if it's always, let's say this was, um, I don't know what the numbers were offhand for this one, but let's say it's uh, uh, 20 inches per second. The flow is going 20 inches per second past your coral. All right, you'd want to know that. But you'd also want to know what the fluctuations look like. Like, is it going from 19 to 21 inches per second? Or is it going from 10 to 30 inches per second? Because, you know, 30 might be the, the number that sweeps the coral off of your, uh, uh, off of your, um, uh, your rocks you're trying to grow it on. Or, um, you know, so there'd be, uh, there'd be different ways to classify, to quantify this. But that's a, that's a good question. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, uh, the down uh, it, once you're down a meter or so from the ocean's uh, surface, the the fluctuations of the waves going back and forth, uh, you could you could in, in principle match the performance of the pump to the the type of gyre that you're hoping to to establish. Um, yeah, so in fact, you, you could use these time-based controls, right, to make your pump go faster and slower. In any case, there's a, this, but that's a good observation uh, that, you know, that the flow, it does seem to be sinusoidal there. So. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. You are going to see turbulence at the surface of a water body of waves, nature's only downside the pressures of the Yeah, so um, I guess um, the issue of turbulence coming out of the pump, all, uh, you can always dial a pump back uh, to a low enough flow that it's not going to come out turbulent. I think with any of the pumps that, that I've seen, when, you, when they're turned up to 100%, uh, the flow coming out of them is turbulent. Um, and so then the, uh, the other observation was, you know, by the time you have this flowing over some complicated structure of rocks, the circulation that you're going to see in the tank is, uh, is, is generally laminar. And I think that's, that's true as well. And you, and you do need to watch out for things like, um, I guess one of the issues we've been having a hard time with is how to quantify the performance of the pump because what you care about as, uh, as an aquarium enthusiast is, you know, am I going to be able to uh, circulate the water appropriately for the animals that I'm trying to grow? Uh, and um, that depends a lot on what you put in the tank, right? And, and no manufacturer knows what you're going to put in the tank. So if you build yourself a, a wall out of rocks, you might create dead spots where you're not going to get any flow. So uh, I'm not sure how to solve that problem other than intelligent, uh, you know, right, you know, experience uh, of the hobbyist. So that's a good observation, though. Other questions? 
All right. Well, thank you. I guess it's lunchtime. <laughs> thank you.